I'm delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to be in conversation with, with Carol. Um, as Brian hinted, we've had different sorts of careers, but parallel careers, and that's one of the things I want to explore. But let me first of all say a word about this department, the sociology department, um, because it played a crucial role in my own rather uncertain career. Um, I was here as a Simon Senior Fellow from 89 to 90, uh, taking leave of absence from an administrative job at the old CNEA, where I'd retreated four or five years earlier because I couldn't get an academic job. Um, and in a sense, being here, meeting colleagues like David and Sue and uh, many others, I got back into academic life. I wrote half of what became my next book. Um, and literally, it transformed my career and my life because um, while I was here, I, I actually got my first uh, professorial appointment. Um, so it was a crucial period, and I've been eternally grateful um, to the uh, department ever since. And I've been very proud of my continuing association with it, and more recently with the Morgan Centre. But that um, theme of an uncertain career strikes me as something you and I have in common, Carol, because like me, you took time out of uh, um, an academic career. Um, and I think, like me, part of the problem, um, the socio-economic circumstances, but part of it was the work we were doing, which at that point was not particularly mainstream, certainly marginal, um, and was highly political. Do you have a feeling that that's what held you back, in a sense? Um, I think I would just add a corrective. I, I didn't take time out. I was pushed out. <laughs> <laughs> I was being polite. <laughs> <laughs> because I had been on a, a, a three-year, what was then still SSRC fellowship at the University of Sheffield. We've got some people from Sheffield here. You're not to blame. Um, <laughs> and uh, at the end of that period, um, the regime had changed, and I think issues of, of politics, feminist politics, was really significant. And um, I think I was just seen as too much trouble, and I didn't get a post. Although it remains one of these little sort of irritating things that they then, of course, appointed a man to teach all my courses, which were all about feminism and law and all of those kinds of areas. Um, and I was left without a job for, for some years. Um, uh, thereafter, I mean, one got little things and and uh, and so on, and then of course I ended up at the National Council for One Parent Families, uh, which was a really interesting sort of period, and and in a, in a sense I think possibly today people would feel very reluctant to step out of academe and go and do something different for, for very good reasons, but in retrospect I'm really glad that mm. I did that, and I think you feel that as well. Oh, very much so. Uh, I mean, actually, like you, I was in a sense pushed out of um, a post um, by the Tory government coming in in 1979 because my SSRC fellowship was up for renewal. Uh, there was a budget in July. Uh, they cut the budget to the SSRC, and I lost my job in August. Um, so uh, there was an enduring pain. Thatcherism was real for me right, <laughs> from, the, right from the beginning. Um, but. I'm interested in exploring a bit more of this political theme because you've, you've said on different, occasion, uh, different occasions that you saw writing as engagement and you've talked about your early work, well you talked about it at the time, as part of an emancipatory project. So you were explicit about the politics of your work. Um, and I mean I think it's been a theme throughout. And, I'll ask you more about that later on. Do you want to say a little more about that sort of politics? Yes, I, I mean, I, th I think actually, though, uh, earlier on, um, it wasn't just writing mm. that I saw as part of a political project. And again, I think it's probably the same for you as well. We, we were both actually engaged in mm. various emancipatory movements at the time. I mean, I'd been involved in a campaign about um, uh, prisons and women in prisons you know, in, at one stage. And then I was involved with an organization called Rights of Women, who were producing documents and engaging with issues. And um, uh, people like Mary McIntosh mm. as well were involved in that at, at the time. So there was a, a real sort of political 
sort of strand of activism, which was then also, I think, reflected in the writing that was going on then too. And um, I, I think at the time it was felt really, really important to bring those kinds of politics into our writing, which can sound, I think, a bit um, uncomfortable now, because it sounds as if you had a political agenda and then you would go and do your research and make sure that it fitted into a particular political agenda. But, um, and there's, there's something of that in there, but except in the sense that then, um, of course, the whole idea of, of feminism and gender difference, there was, there was this huge terrain where there had been no research done at all. Um, and so in a sense, it was, it was a fantastic kind of opportunity um, so the mere fact of looking at, say, issues of gender or, look, for in your case, looking at sexuality was itself, you know, pretty radical. Mm. And then to do it with a particular kind of perspective, a political perspective as well. But I, but I also think, and I know in your work, your, your uh, historical work, and I think in my empirical work, one of the things we both would have found very quickly is nothing's as straightforward as no. that. <laughs> and you don't just bring your <coughs> politics in from outside and sort of impose it, uh, because actually the work you're doing challenges how you think. Absolutely. Um, I know from my own work that the development of what became known as social constructionism in history actually challenged many of the fundamentals of the gay movement I was involved in. Mm -hmm. um, and my work was seen as antipathetical. And I'm sure you had some of the same um, experience. There are hard lessons from doing um, scholarship in a highly politicized area. But then I think the, the scholarship developed its own perspectives. I was very struck by, I think you say it in The Ties That Bind, that history, you, you do history with a purpose. Mm. Um, and it's not a narrow political purpose in a party political sense, or even in a party pre-sense. But it is actually a sense you just don't do it for its own sake. It's not um, scholarship for its own sake. It's scholarship in order to understand something. Yes, I mean, I, I, I went through a phase, and it's, it's something that maybe I can even pick up again if I have more time now, um, of really appreciating that historical perspective. Mm -hmm. And again, I think it was important in both of our, our works that for people to understand the situation of, of women or sexual minorities or whatever it might be at a given time, you had to have some kind of background to it, particularly to challenge some of the sort of naturalistic <coughs> fallacies that were going on at the time. Yes, well, women are naturally more inclined to housework, mm. etc. Well, using history, understanding the sort of the construction of the present was vital, I think, yes. in that project. Um, this brings up a uh, so elephant in the room, the name of Michel Foucault. Uh, because <laughs> what you and I were doing, not necessarily influenced from the beginning by Foucault's work, but almost instinctively at first, was to problematize gender, problematize sexuality, to try to understand the historical and social conditions which gave rise to the categories we took for granted. And that's certainly why I found Foucault appealing. But that's, it was around Foucault we first met, if mm. I remember rightly. Um, I came to a conference in Sheffield uh, on Foucault, um, and um, there was a tremendous excitement. It's difficult to uh, um, remember quite how, ex forget rather, difficult to forget how e exciting that was at the time, the sense of um, a t transformation of our theoretical perspectives, a questioning of the taken for granted. Um, some people, I think, find the same from reading Gilles Deleuze today. I'm afraid I'm baffled by that, but never mind. Um, it's, uh, it's that sense of intellectual and political excitement uh, at the same time. Well, well, it was huge, but there was, there was also a lot of um, antipathy, of course, mm. towards Foucault. And I think one of the really sort of significant issues around feminist scholarship at the time, of course, was um, adopting a slightly different analysis <coughs> of power. And that really did create quite a... Mm. a, a, a a divide, I think, in the feminist movement about how power should be understood. And, and it, it's also part of that kind of anti-essentialism mm. as well, of course, it's part of Foucault. And there were those, I think, feminists, I mean, you, you could argue it's around the patriarchy debates and, and issues of power. And my perspective on that would be that the adoption of a more Foucauldian approach actually allowed us to move forward mm. 
to some extent, and to, to see some the greater complexities of power, and also to start to shift away from the kind of victimization kind of ideas of, of, of uh, how power operated, as well as the kind of, I still really do enjoy these ideas of the productive notions of, of power mm. as well, which again has obviously been present in your work. Oh, absolutely, it's been crucial. I've never th thought of myself as a Foucauldian, but Foucault was one of the key elements in my thinking around sexuality, around power, around structure, and around agency. Now, in a sense, looking o over your writing as a whole, it seems to me there are various phases and sub-phases, but there are two, correct me if I'm wrong on this, but there seem to be two different um, moments. There's the moment in the 80s, 70s and 80s perhaps, which is more concerned with the structure of oppression. And then there's a moment from the 90s on which is more concerned with the way people live their lives. Um, and I want to explore those, those two. But how important do you think it is to hold in balance those, those two things? Well, I think one of the things I've often said uh, to, to m maybe more of a postgraduate level of, uh, of audience is it's important to have the first before you move on to the second. <laughs> Because there is a sense in which that understanding of the, the, the structures of society and, 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 and how they have come about and how they operate and uh, various elements of it, before you can kind of move on to, um, I'm explaining that maybe chronologically, but perhaps it doesn't have to be like that, but before <coughs> you move on to that, that more nuanced understanding of those everyday interactions, otherwise I think you get a bit stuck the way that um, Goffman was ultimately quite problematic, notwithstanding his work has been terribly important and, and mm. so on. But somehow you need that. I mean, and obviously that comes from a Marxist approach and, and so on and that kind of work that was, was, was done then. Because in a sense, it always gives you that broader contextual understanding, at least it does for me. I mean, not everybody may agree with that, but I do actually think you need to have both. But I suppose in my own work, I got a bit fed up banging on about the structural. Yes. <laughs> and because I was also, when I did sociology, social interactionism was quite a big thing, and I just found that so fascinating. that I Because uh, this is something actually Ken Plummer once said to me. He said, you've always been a social interactionist, really, haven't you? Um, and I'd never really thought about it that way. But I think that did, it, in a sense, what came back in, yeah. in a, obviously yeah. a different form later. Well, looking over your work, I mean, it's clear that even at your high theory bit... Yes, I could uh, do high theory. Uh, well. yeah, <laughs> absolutely. You, you talked about your scepticism towards theoretical determinism uh, and the need to... the fact that too much is left on the cutting room floor in certain sorts of sociology. So you, you've always, in a sense, distanced yourself from the, the worst sort of scholasticism around theory. You use theory as a tool to think th yes. through certain issues. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, uh, th I mean, again, and that does borrow from Foucault, mm. of course, but, but that way of conceptualising, it's no good having these ideas uh, just for themselves. They're meant to be explaining things yeah, and assisting people <laughs> to under, understand things, I think. But, but no, th th I mean, it's interesting you say that because I think there was a phase at which I did become very theoretically oriented and was trying to work through a number of ideas and, and that was also the, a sort of key socio-legal phase where I, I was stamped as a feminist jurist prude of all things um, and, and you know doing that kind of work but it did start to feel what is the point of this and, and in a way what, what I think is quite interesting and, and I'm not trying to be divisive here but obviously feminism also was taking a turn I mean theory became more and more important and then there was what is referred to as a sort of cultural turn and quite a lot of feminism did become incredibly theoretical mm. and, and, and in one sense I found myself at that point really wanting to turn back again into just talking to people I really like mm. to talk to people, so you do an empirical project. I, I, I want to talk about your work on the family and how mm. that developed. Um, as an entree to that, I wonder if I could just say something about Mary McIntosh, mm. because you mentioned her at the beginning. Um, you and I were due to have a, a dialogue about her in January um, at the Institute of Education in London, and uh, you unfortunately got trapped on a train that had broken down, so we never had the dialogue. 
And in fact, I had to reconstruct mentally a dialogue, a conversation with you in your absence. Um, <coughs> but of course, um, a key book in the whole debate about the family was the book she did with Michelle Barrett, The Antisocial Family. Um, and that's an interesting book, looking at it again, which I did for this meeting. Um, because it's, it's both heavily theoretical in some ways. But at the end, they talk about um, the need to explore experiments in living, life experiments, as Giddens calls them. But the phrase actually comes from John Stuart Mill originally. And that is a way through to, in a sense, what you began to do. Um, because the next time I got fully involved with you in the, in the 90s was when you were co-editing the book on, um, on families, on new families. Um, and in a sense, the move seemed to me to be in your work from your most theoretical feminist phrase, a phase of looking for alternatives to the family, to beginning to look at alternative families, mm. although you didn't use the words in that sense. But the book on new families, in a sense, opened up all sorts of new avenues. Um, were you conscious at that time of making a sort of mini epistemological break to uh, be grand about it in your own work? Yes, I think so. I, th I think I was. Uh, um, because at that time when the new family, which I um, co-edited, no, actually Elizabeth, was it Elizabeth um, mm. Silva with, the, with Elizabeth, um, I had already started <coughs> to do uh, other empirical projects. Um, uh, particularly on divorce, and then there was a whole raft of research on children and childhood mm. as well, which of course I got into, because mm. it did seem to me at the time, and obviously there were others starting to do work, or had already been doing work in this field at that time, but it was growing in momentum, that, that here was, a, if you like, a, a social grouping where very little had been said and where issues of power were particularly kind mm. of significant. But yes, I, but the, there was a kind of break, um, Although I do, and, and in one sense, I think this is something Jock Young said, and although I've never been a great fan of Jock, um, at one point I think he said something like, we, we, as sociologists, what we tend to do is we get bored with something, and that pro propels us to do something slightly different. So I, I think there was also a personal mm. element of that, of, and, and, and a sense that, that one could only get so far with, with the more theoretical work. And, but th because the irony is, and I've always found this an irony, because whenever one says, you know, whose work influenced you? Well, you, I, you and I might, would probably both say Foucault, but you tend to come up with those names mm. of the boy theorists, don't you? Um, and the work that I, I sometimes feel, and I've, I've often felt irritated about this in sociology, the work that is most influential is indeed that kind of, at that theoretical level, and that theoretical level travels and can speak more internationally. Mm. Whereas often the more historical mm. and detailed or the more empirical <laughs> is simply seen as rather parochial and as if it doesn't have a wider message. And that remains a, a point of irritation mm. for me, I think. It does in me as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Well, you, you must have had similar experiences. Uh, well, very similar. Um, but in terms of new families, um, when you asked me to contribute to that book, me and Brian and uh, Catherine, um, we, uh, I think it was in the midst of us gathering data um, for our families of choice project, which was published as same-sex intimacies eventually. So it was exactly the right moment, and in a sense, reinforced what we felt we were doing, that there was something more going on um, than just changes in gay life or, or changes in, in attitudes to marriage. There was something real shifting Mm. Um, so I think the move may have been boredom with high theory, but actually it was touching a zeitgeist, I think. It, mm -hmm. was, it was picking up signs that there was a fundamental transformation of attitudes oh, going oh, on. For sure, definitely, definitely. But I, I'm interested too, because you obviously moved during that period from just historical work into doing contemporary empirical yeah. research. So you were obviously touched by the same kind of set of issues. Well, absolutely. I mean, there was a, there was a sense of impasse in just abstract theory um, and theorising about history and, uh, and uh, 
sexual oppression or whatever. Uh, you needed to look at it uh, on the ground. There were other pushes as well, of course, because by then I, I had a professorship and uh, um, I was under tremendous pressure to raise external money. <laughs> um, and uh, this seemed to me a very obvious area. There was a big ESRC initiative on the family and I managed to get some money from that to do this work on same-sex uh, um, intimacies. Um, so it was a double push. I wanted to move into more empirical work anyway, but in a sense, career-wise, professionally, there was a big push to do it. Um, and uh, so it was, the two came together very, very nicely. But I think uh, this idea that what we're looking at now is alternative families, rather than alternatives to the family, mm. is, is pretty important because uh, it opened up all sorts of other avenues, um, not least breaking away from the idea that society was narrowly structured in dominance um, and a recognition that actually we were moving into a much more fluid um, situation in, in social mobility, social attitudes, and so on, which theorists on the left had not actually picked up on very clearly it seemed to me at the time. Well, well, no, I mean, because again, I think what was interesting is, is certainly from a feminist perspective, for an awfully long time, you, you never taught a course on the family. Yeah. Um, I didn't, th I don't think I taught it till I came here probably, yeah. which is kind of interesting. One did courses on sexuality, one did, uh, I did courses on the body and so on, because there was a sort of sense in which Although you might be talking about the same issues under these other headings, it, it, it was never going to be the family because mm. that, that, in a sense, had, had become identified in a certain kind of, 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 of way. And, and <coughs> one actually did act, want to be able to see difference. There was this kind of notion of what those courses should be and what was of interest, which didn't fit with, I think, what, what most people were interested in or what they were doing or even the lives of some of our students and so on at the time. So, so I. I, I do actually think that was quite an, in, an, an important shift at the time, but it also enabled us, I think, to start bringing in, back in, the sorts of things that we thought was important, yeah. really, in everyday life. And <coughs> well, in a sense, you were engaging with what David has written about family, the doing of family mm. and the doing of personal life, um, which brings us neatly to uh, the setting up of the Morgan Centre, because you came here from Leeds, Leeds about 10 years ago, was it, to set up it's nine. the centre? Nine, nine years ago. Um, I'm not going to ask why you did it, um, <laughs> but well. what did you think you were doing <laughs> <laughs> when you came here to set up the centre? <laughs> There's always push-pull. <laughs> There's always push-pull factors. Um, well, I... I think we thought we were doing a number of things, and it was a we, because we did come as a, as a group and we did have discussions about <coughs> it. Um, and, and obviously there was a bait dangled, you know. Um, and I think, sp speaking for maybe some of us, Brian hadn't been long at Leeds at the point at which we uprooted him and <laughs> persuaded him to move again. And um, But... There was very much a sense of context for intellectual excitement and a sense of what you can do. And I think, I think for us, there was a sense that this could be a particular kind of beginning that we could stamp in different ways. So using David's name was really very important for us and, and hopefully for him because um, it, it, it was, we really wanted to capture that incredibly rich history that was reflected in, in his work. There was also a breadth, of course, in his work. His work wasn't only, as we've heard this morning, <coughs> on families and so on. It was obviously um, wider than that. But we felt that would give us a particular kind of freedom as well. And I think we're really glad that we called it the Morgan Center. And there's a, there was a lot of things after that, which mostly we have ended up dropping off, and now we've added something different. But in a way, it doesn't matter because it's the Morgan Center. The other thing that it enabled us to do, and I really feel that this was a fantastic feature of what's happened here, um, was we didn't just have to focus on 
uh, family and relationships. We had this very strong methodological arm mm. as well. And part of, I think, what the Morgan Centre went on to do, and whether we quite planned it in this way is another matter, but what happened was we started to think of other ways of doing research that could facilitate the, the, the emergence of other kinds of ideas or ways of representing um, people's family, everyday lives, personal lives and relationships um, outwardly in a much more sort of fulsome kind of way. Mm. So interestingly, I think a number of us, um, I never thought I'd be interested in methodology, um, but Jennifer always has been, of course, and I found myself very much sort of drawn into that. So those two things about not just the areas, but how you go about researching it. So I would say that that kind of methodological drive became as important for the Morgan Centre as, say, some of the theoretical drive mm. was for some works, you know, in previous decades. Mm -hmm. And we've tried to keep those two things together, but very, very much as a team. And that, mm. isn't, that isn't me and my idea by any means. Mm. And actually, that was another really good thing, I think, about the Morgan Centre, because although in the height of feminism we all talked about collectiveness, I've never really felt it until about you know 2005 when we came here, and we really, really did work very collectively, um, and I think started to generate a different kind of knowledge. What struck me listening to the papers today, although the, the subjects are <coughs> not necessarily identical, there's a common intellectual endeavour and a common interest in methodology, as you say, which gives the Morgan work. Uh, a distinct flavour, actually. Um, it's recognisable, I think someone said this, but it, it is recognisable anywhere. And it's exploring um, areas that other sociologists may not be terribly interested in, but it's opening up all sorts of avenues. And I, I, I think of this as, in a sense, your and other colleagues, but specifically your effective turn. It's, it's uh, a phrase I don't like particularly, but it's much bandied about in the social sciences, the, the turn to feeling, to thinking about affect, to thinking of the non-human, the post-human even. Um, but it seems to me in a quiet way, you've done precisely that in mm. your work over the last uh, 10 years. Mm. Um, it was underway before the Morgan Centre, I suppose, but obviously your interaction with colleagues here has um, pushed you further along that route. Well, I think I think we we felt we got more of a sort of more in it, it, this. I don't know to how this will sound. I was going to say more intellectual freedom. It's not as if mm. we didn't have intellectual freedom before, because as largely as an academic, at least until relatively recently, you sort of did. Mm. But but there was a flowering here, which I think was really important. And I also think we attempted to bring that into not not just our work, but also tried to create a slightly different kind of sociology, because one of the things that I bang on about until it's a bit boring, um, but, but my thing is, how do we write about the personal? How do we write about the lives of others? What is our, in, in one sense, it's an ethical responsibility to represent lives rather mm. more fully, but then that actually brings in its wake uh, a set of issues, but how do you actually do mm. it? So uh, writing in and of itself as a sociological practice started mm. to become very important to me and I suspect other colleagues as well in the centre. Well, it certainly was important to me at the same time because uh, I've always been struck by the fact that your pers book, Personal Life, um, explores memory, family memories and so on, um, and as well as theoretical issues. Whereas at the same time I was publishing my book, The World We Have Won, yes. which opens with a personal reflection on being born in 1945 in South Wales and so on, and what that said about gender and sexuality. So in a sense, again, we were being pushed, without ever discussing it, into exploring the same sort of issues. Mm, it must be the social atmospheres that Jennifer <laughs> is talking about going on here. <laughs> but one of the things that's always impressed me about your work, and it's there in the work on childhood, um, um, is talking about the moral intensity of, of social worlds, of different social worlds, uh, and of ordinary life. Um, now, where did you get that from, and uh, uh, how has it directed you um, in your work? <laughs> That's quite a hard... I hadn't really quite thought of it that way, although I know I now feel it. I think it probably would have started... 
it, it started the minute I really started to do empirical work, even though I probably didn't know it, when I was meeting people so very different from me, mm. who saw the world so very differently. And um, in, those, in those times, if people saw the world very differently, there was a tendency to think that they were wrong. Um, but I've always had some difficulty with that. Um, and I think it then, then grew. And then once you're doing work on children, you have to, in a sense, you have a particular care. Mm. Because, uh, again, as Al Alison here will, will tell you, they don't tell you straightforward stories. And um, so you've got, to, you've got to listen very hard mm. to what's going on and, and how you sort of represent that. And it did kind of grow with me also, my irritation with, with, with perhaps some other quite big names in sociology who seem to just write about people as you know this um, people who did this these trivial things or they had these really shallow relationships and so on and so forth mm. and I really began to feel well I didn't meet any of those people I might have met people I didn't like or people who did things that I really disapproved of and so on but but once nonetheless had to be a bit more careful mm. of of what was going on um, and also that kind of sense of, uh, I, I described this once in something I wrote, probably a bit pretentiously, because um, I was a, a, a big fan of Philip Pullman and, and his work at one point. Various points in my career when I've been particularly unhappy, I've read <laughs> things like Harry Potter or Philip Pullman and, and so on for escapism. Philip Pullman has this description of um, wh where there are, in a sense, of it's, a, it's a kind of parallel universe that he's talking about. Um, and how the, the, the main character in, in this um, uh, well, his series of novels watches somebody kind of vanish and he takes a knife and he cuts through the atmosphere, the air, whatever it is, and is able to pull it apart and step through. And he steps through into something which is almost exactly the same as where, where he stepped away from but it's also different. And values and other things are, are, are rather different in this other world, although the, the buildings look the same, the grass is still green and, and so on. And it struck me that whenever you're, having, whenever you're interviewing people, that's in a sense what happens. Mm. And once you've been there with people, you can't then kind of step back through and just say, Tuh, you know, aren't they silly or they've got that wrong or that doesn't matter or whatever. So it's, it's almost a physical kind of experience and it's one of the things that I sort of, it's why I always feel that as soon as you do start to really listen to people, it changes you and, and that's the impact it's had on say our politics mm. and things in the past and why some people might look at it as having softened in various ways or opting out, but I don't actually see it in that way at all. I don't either. I've, I've got a little quote from you which I, I like very much that your work is um, an intellectual and ethical commitment to representing the everyday lives of ordinary people in the fullest and most nuanced way possible. And that seems to be a really accurate uh, description of what you've been doing. Um, and what strikes me about it is that, as I said earlier, in your uh, um, undemonstrative way, because you've not broadcast about this and theorised about it in a grand way, you've actually done exactly what some of the theorists of our fact claim to be doing. But often their work is so abstract um, and detached from any empirical basis, um, historically or contemporaneously, that you don't quite know what it's all about. Whereas when you read your work, and indeed your colleagues here, you get a sense that this is what it's about. But it is, as you say, um, potentially seen as a turn away from Mm. from politics mm. um, and I've been criticised, I'm sure you have explicitly, for not writing explicit political text. But I wonder, um, and I remember raising this with you when um, at, your, at the conference commemorating your work a couple of years back, um, what does it feel like to still be a feminist in a world without a feminist movement? It's like a commitment without a movement. Mm. <laughs> um, when I wrote my first book, um, and probably my second and third and onwards a bit, they all tended to have the word feminist or feminism in the title, and I remember saying, and I would never, ever, you know, step away from that, um, 
That's, you know, I will always want that stamp on everything I publish. Uh, but I have stepped away from it. Um, and um, in, in a way, there is two things going on. Um, I think one is that sort of sense of if you actually do want to bring certain things forward and have people understand certain aspects of social and personal life, uh, sometimes that label is a, is a problem. Mm. And particularly the field I was working in, which was in, in some of the sort of more socio-legal areas, um, given I was, I was fortunate enough, for example, to be able to go and give lectures to judges and stuff, um, that was actually, and I, and I, so I did this kind of balance and thinking what mattered more, being able to speak to certain constituents or, in a sense, maintain a badge. But of course, at the same time, the movement was changing, becoming something different. Um, and uh, so one started to feel rootless. But on the other hand, I think what replaced a lot of that kind of um, collective action, that those kinds of political debates that, that you and I were both involved in in our various spheres, was actually the empirical work that I was doing. It, it, it became filled with much more meaning. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, if you like, there's, there's, a there's certainly a compensation. Yeah. And of course, politics changes, doesn't yeah. it, anyway? Um, uh, somewhere, I was looking for the quote, but I can't find it at the moment. Um, you say in one of your books, I think in the 80s, that uh, you were concerned to explore relationships without marriage. Um, and you mentioned there, quite presciently, the fact that there was beginning to be a demand for same-sex marriage. And you more or less said, why should we go that? We want a world without marriage. Why should we consider it? Of course, later, uh, you became an explorer precisely of um, same-sex marriage. Um, and uh, with Brian and others, uh, have written very sensitive things about the way people's attitudes have been changed through going through a commitment ceremony or, or, or same-sex or civil partnership. Um, now, that's a highly political thing. There was a moment, in one sense, it looks like the abandonment of grand theoretical anti-marriage things. But in another sense, it's a response to changing things on the ground and the way in which same-sex marriage became a political issue. So the context, rather than the abstract notion of what it is, <coughs> is determining the politics. But, uh, but I also think sometimes people who do regret the whole sort of move towards you know, more marriage. Uh, and it, of course, there isn't a blanket move towards more mm. marriage anyway. Uh, forget the extent to which feminist um, interventions have changed mm. the institution. I, I mean, dramatically. I mean, when I started writing about it, it was still perfectly fine for husbands to rape their wives, which is now, if I say that to my students, they think I'm talking about the dark ages. Mm. You know, it's not imaginable. Um, I mean, domestic violence remains a hideous problem, but you know, m people just thought it was a bit of a joke in those days. So you, see, that's why you need the structural yeah. as well as the other, because I think mm. if one was just, uh, and if you think about Peter Burge's book, um, the, the one that he wrote um, on married couples and oh, yeah, so on, yeah. um, I went back to look at that. When I first read it, oh, you know, you threw it across the mm. room in rage because it was all about the interiority of marriages and couples and how, how they worked, but without any of the kind of context. And that was at a time of huge inequalities mm. and so on and so forth. Um, but if you go back to it now and you start to read it, you, you, can, you can see other things there, mm -hmm. so to speak. So, so much has changed in well, that context. Well, I'll have to reread it. Um, <laughs> how much more time have we got? That's all right. I've lost the blog. We should have finished ten minutes ago. You've got about three minutes. <laughs> <laughs> well, can I ask a final question? Because we've talked a lot about writing and publication. Um, I wanted to ask you about publishing. Mm. Because we had a word about this uh, earlier, but uh, or an email exchange, um, about the changing nature of publishing. Yeah. Um, because one of the striking things was both of, both of us had very insecure careers through the 70s and 80s yet we published a lot. Mm. Um, today, it's actually quite difficult to get PhDs and so on published um, by publishers. There's a much tighter market. Um, 
So it's a bit odd that when it was politically insecure and academically insecure, you could get anything, but not anything, but <laughs> good work published without challenge. And today it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that is really, really interesting. And it's not just that you could get books or your PhD thesis published, um, but you could get these wonderful things called edited collections published yeah. as well. And, and I know that some of the most influential books that I read were edited collections, which publishers are now so unhappy with, particularly if they come out of conferences, for example. I mean, um, and, and, and that's a real problem. And, and, I, and thinking about my own publishing career, it seems that to get a book contract in those days was easy peasy. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and even to have some influence over the cover of books, mm -hmm. thinking about some recent experiences um, that, that, that one might have on that front. Um, but there was quite an interesting kind of resistance to publishing in the peer-reviewed journals. Mm. And I, I, I was looking at my CV for something uh, a, a while ago, and, and it was really interesting that I had books published and you, you would be the same, but mm. you know, I didn't publish in the British Journal of Sociology. No. I didn't publish in sociology. I didn't publish in, in those kinds of areas. And, and that was, I think, part also of how feminism, which was so vital in academe, was, of course, setting up alternative journals, uh, as well as influencing publishers and so on. And I issues around sexuality, yeah. your own yeah. field as well. Yeah. And then, obviously, Ken's uh, setting up sexualities and yeah. so on, um, uh, going elsewhere. And then suddenly finding a sea change in academe and you've got a great hole in your yeah. CV where apparently your work has never been judged by peer review or adequately. Yeah. But you were an editor as well as a writer. Yes, you know, yes. Set up social legal studies. Yes. Um, and are you still involved? No. <laughs> <laughs> there comes a moment when you have to close the door. Yeah. Uh, but perhaps that's the moment for us to close the door. Thanks very much, Thank Carol. You, Thank you,